Well, thank you. Thank you so much, everyone. It is truly an honor to be here today. And uh, wow, I, what a tough act to follow to be the last talk of the day. Um, all right, well, let's see what I can do. Uh, so my name is Zach Williams, and uh, like Paul so elegantly said, this is my perspective as an autistic scientist conducting autism research. Um, so before we get into it, just a couple of disclosures um, and moving on. Um, so since this is a talk about my, my personal perspective, I just wanted to uh, first give you all this, just a little bit about me. Um, so to start off, in 1995, I was born in Santa Barbara, California, just a couple hours north of Los Angeles. And when I was four years old, I was, uh, in 1999, diagnosed with autism, or what was then the fairly new diagnosis of Asperger's syndrome. Um, so fast forward a bit, you know, just skip my whole childhood. I then uh, <laughs> went in, in 2013 to Yale University, where I studied psychology and neuroscience and actually worked in the, uh, uni the lab of none other than Dr. Jamie McPartland, uh, who you've already worked, uh, heard from today. Um, and in 2015, in my sophomore year of undergrad, and that was the year I decided I wanted to be an autism researcher. Um, in fact, you've got a nice little uh, picture there of me at my first international meeting for autism research with a poster. Um, in fact, 2015 was also the year I got my first um, grant in, for autism research from the Autism Science Foundation to do an undergraduate summer, <laughs> believe it or not. Um, and so that actually was the, the time that I decided that I didn't just want to go to medical school. I actually wanted to do more than that. I wanted to go and get into autism research and become a physician scientist and be an autism researcher. So that's what I've set out to do. And so since graduating from Yale, I have enrolled in Vanderbilt's MD-PhD program. And now I'm nearing the end of that. I'm three quarters of the way to being two doctors. And uh, <laughs> I am now in uh, hopefully a year away from my PhD and two years away from my MD. And after spring 2025, I will continue on to a research track residency in psychiatry and will uh, focus on the psychiatric care of autistic adults. So it's a long path, but here I am, still chugging away, and I'll, I'll do it, hopefully. <laughs> so today's talk is going to focus on, oh, thank you guys, really. No, I'm, I'm here because I love it. But uh, <laughs> Today's talk is going to focus on the perspective I've gained over the last eight years. So really this, this time since I've, I've joined Autism Research as an autistic person conducting autism research and, and clinical work. Um, so what, what have I learned over that period? Well, the first insight I want to share is, is just how valuable it can be to have lived experience, to be an autistic person in this space um, when you're conducting autism research. So from the moment I've, uh, I started doing autism research, the fact that I was autistic myself was, was an asset to the rest of my team. My personal experiences were often directly relevant to the processes we were studying in the lab, be they uh, just sort of a general basic social cognitive processes or things that were more clinically relevant in, in people's everyday lives. Um, and the lived experience that I had complemented the scientific and clinical experiences that we were studying more academically. But it wasn't just that I had these self-advocate experiences that we could bring in, but I was actually melding them with the experiences that I was learning in the lab. And having those two perspectives was more than I could do just as a self-advocate or just that I could do as an academic, but having unique insights that I put together uh, from the two of them was, was truly something that neither a, an academic or a self-advocate could do. Um, and though I was often the only autistic person in the room, I, I do think that I wasn't ever the only person with a lived experience in the room. Really, in fact, I think autism research is pretty unique because there are a lot of people here, even just among the researchers, who have personal connections to autism. We see a lot of family members, people who are siblings, people who are parents, um, that have very close ties to autism. And this is a, this is a field where you have people with a whole lot of, of community involvement uh, just all throughout the field. Um, but interestingly enough, in, in psychology, this is often discouraged. You know, in fact, traditionally, this dual perspective of you know, doing what they call self-relevant research or you know, more like you know, traditionally or you know, informally me-search um, has been uh, stigmatized, actually. Um, and if you like, survey psychologists, people like, have a pretty negative opinion of this. This is actually a very recent paper. 
Um, but interestingly enough, this, this is something we in the field and, and broader psychology have been trying to change. Um, so there have been a number of scholars more recently who have been pushing back against this approach in calls both within and outside autism research have been encouraging the training and retention of researchers with relevant lived experience. So like these authors, I believe that researchers with these lived experiences and particularly other autistic people, autism researchers who have this lived experience personally of autism can only improve the field. And similar to community involvement via participatory research where you include stakeholders directly in the research team, this can only improve the, the research process and their dual perspectives should increase both the scientific rigor and the accessibility of the field's research outputs. So hopefully this can convince you that the process of having these lived experience researchers on the team is important. So what are we as a field actually doing to nurture this community? Well, for one thing, INSAR, the International Society for Autism Research, um, as our main professional society for aut autism researchers, has come up with this body called the Autistic Researchers Committee, or the ARC, to uh, provide institutional support for the growing demographic of autistic researchers. And so I don't have a laser pointer, but you can see down here at the bottom of the screen, this is the current uh, INSAR arc for the 2022-2023 year, which I do chair. Um, and so this is a great body of autistic folks, all researchers, all very talented people that I, I think is doing a great job to help bring forward this, uh, this new committee. Um, and we have a number of goals that I think are very important to uh, help bring forward the, uh, the autistic researcher community, specifically within INSAR. Um, and so one thing we do is in this committee helps increase the accessibility of INSAR as an organization, but also at the INSAR annual meeting, um, which is the INSAR's main professional conference for autism researchers. The other thing the INSAR ARC does is create mentorship and career development opportunities for autistic researchers. If you want autistic researchers to get involved in research, of course, they have to be able to have research careers. So having that be available is important. We also want to make INSAR more inclusive and anti-ableist as an organization, make autistic people want to join the field. And of course, we also want to promote community-informed and participatory research with our INSAR community collaborator request initiative. We don't want this just to be an autistic people's research club. We want to have non-autistic researchers be able to incorporate autistic perspectives into their research and have all sorts of lived experience be you know, relevant and important. Um, it's also important to know that this isn't just something that INSAR and this one organization has been a part of. There has been a really important new wave of organizations within autism research that's found this demographic to be important to support. And over the last several years, a number of organizations have started to put into effect several different um, initiatives that have been supporting um, autistic research, including the Autism Intervention Research Network on Physical Health, ARP, the Participatory Autism Research Collective in the UK, Aspire in Portland, and the Autistic Health Research Network. Um, and as a major step forward, Autism Speaks actually this year released their first dedicated uh, pre-doctoral funding mechanism specifically for one autistic doctoral student to pursue research. Um, and ARP is actually expected to do something similar in the next year. Um, so again, all of this to say that uh, there's a lot of institutional support coming forward um, to show that autistic researchers are indeed supported in this field. Um, Switching gears a little bit, back to me, another dual role that I actually have <laughs> is that aside from being a researcher, I actually participate in quite a lot of research myself. So I'm enrolled in the Simons Foundation's Spark platform where I do a lot of online studies. And I also participate in quite a few in-person studies at Vanderbilt University Medical Center. And not all of them are actually focused on autism either. In fact, I was one of the original participants in Moderna's COVID vaccine trial. I'm vaccinated for monkeypox now. That's pretty cool. Didn't need that, but that was like another 900 bucks in my pocket. Um, yeah, cool stuff. Um, and other things too. Um, but, you know, I'm a, I'm a busy guy. What are the benefits of me doing all this research? I mean, one thing though is that I get a different perspective and it's important to realize that as a researcher, I see all of these research studies that I do from the researcher's perspective. I spent all of this time planning them. I've been able to, uh, you know, 
get very down and dirty. I wrote the grants, I did all of the methodology, et cetera. I don't see what a participant sees when they just get the consent form, they just get a little bit of the information. Having a bit of the researchers or of the participants point of view is very important to realize like what is this like side of the study that the researcher is often blind to. And you become a bit of a research connoisseur too. Um, no, truly, some of my best ideas about how to do and not do research studies have actually just been taken from other people's research studies. I don't know how to do research correctly, neither does anyone else, but if you go you know, sample other people's research, you can get a much better idea of how research should and shouldn't be done. Um, and there's a whole lot of other benefits for researchers and non-researchers alike. I mean, you get a little bit of self-discovery and, you know, get some clinical evaluations done. Um, oftentimes these things come with diagnostic reports, you get vaccinated for monkeypox. Um, and, you know, the nice thing is also you're contributing to the greater scientific enterprise. I mean, I can't value that enough. I think, I, you know, as an autistic person, I love contributing to autism research. That's a really great thing. And anyone in a clinical population, oftentimes, that's the biggest draw of all. You just want to help other people in the field. Um, and you get paid, that's kind of fun too. <laughs> um, but overall, I think, you know, all of this research participation in the end has really given me a, a nice perspective that I've been able to give back to the community and use um, when I'm, I'm helping out and doing various research projects and, and advocacy projects. So one example of that is uh, what I did when I worked in this group of autism community representatives um, convened by Roche uh, when we created the guidebook for participant-friendly clinical trials in autism. And actually, uh, Caroline Averius, who is there taking a picture of me, um, over there at the Genentech table, um, put on this lovely project. Allison Singer was also a part of it and many other lovely autism community representation, representatives from around the world. Um, put on this, this very, very important project. Um, and so this guidebook, which was informed by the collective uh, experiences of Rush scientists, our team of autism stakeholders, and, and myself, um, provides community-informed best practices for investigators conducting clinical trials with autistic participants. Um, and because the experiences that team members had as research participants, including myself, we realized it wasn't actually enough to provide just information to researchers. We realized that there was actually a gap here and we needed something for the participants too. There were going to be people who didn't understand what it meant to be in a clinical trial. They were gonna have questions for the investigators. They weren't going to know what things like placebos and double blinding meant. And they would need something like a clinical trial explainer. Um, and so from having this participatory involvement of a bunch of people who had actually lived this experience of being participants, we had this whole extra deliverable that none of us knew was going to be there going in. Um, and so this is, this is really important. Again, it was part of um, what Evdokia had talked about earlier, this diversity of lived experiences. Like, you know, if we had just gotten perhaps one person on this advisory council who, you know, perhaps hadn't been a research participant before or hadn't participated in clinical trials, this thing could have not happened. We really didn't know that this was it. But really, by having this, again, diversity of experiences, it does improve the process overall. It increases the scientific rigor, it increases the accessibility, and at the end of the day, it increases the impact of the research. So um, that, that just shows you that this is the key to improving not only the research impact, but the impact on the lives of autistic people at the end of the day. Um, and so, I mean, that, this is it really, but uh, here are my key takeaways. Uh, I know I'm over time, but uh, the you know, overall lived experience is extremely valuable in autism research. Um, and this doesn't have to be just from autistic people, but you know, other types of lived experience, be it a personal, family member, et cetera. Um, and this is especially if you have academic training as well. Um, there's also a need to support the newly growing demographic of autistic autism researchers with organizations like the INSAR Autistic Researcher Committee. Um, research participation in research is extremely valuable. This is something I don't think enough people are doing. And also everyone else here should also participate in research because again, researchers need you. Um, and I think that it's just a fun process that we all don't do enough. Um, and then the last thing is for best results, we really do need a diverse group of participants with all sorts of experiences to be a part of these teams because having broad experiences and broad um, overall uh, life <laughs> goals and uh, experiences to 
put together on those teams is what makes this uh, whole enterprise work. So uh, yeah, thank you so much. I, there's just uh, you know a lot to say, but uh, too little time, so I will take your questions now. Thanks so much. <laughs> Thanks, Zach. Um, if I'm entitled to be, I'm very proud of you. Uh, <laughs> of course. I, here's my question. So I actually don't have TikTok, but you hear a lot about like TikTok diagnosis, right? Like someone watches a reel and says like, oh, I have autism. How do you think about the involvement of those kinds of people? Does it matter? I mean, should there be gatekeeping about who counts as an autism researcher? I'm just curious what your thoughts are on that. No, that's a, that's a great question and something I do think about a lot. I am probably in favor of some degree of gatekeeping. Like I, you know, I do think that it's fine for people to have an identity that you assume, but also if that identity is like an actual medical condition, we don't let people go and say like, hey, I have congestive heart failure. I mean, you know, you go and you ask your cardiologist like, hey, do I have congestive heart failure? Like, oh, great, let's like, you know, do a stress echo or like do, you know, there are, there are like procedures in place and you can, go and ask and there's like an appropriate diagnostic construct. Like it's hard because people have like autism the identity and autism the medical diagnosis and there's like some overlap to those things but they're starting to be pulled apart. Um, but I, I do think that especially in the case of like disability as being eligibility for services and disability as being like a relevant category that gets researched and things that we care about medical gatekeeping in those you know places. If you had one thing you could tell all the researchers doing research in autism, what would it be? If I had one thing that I could tell all the researchers doing research in autism, what would it be? Um, no, no, I know. Um, it is that make sure your measures are measuring what you think they are and don't assume that they are. <laughs> <laughs> Hi, thank you so much, first of all, for sharing your story and your experiences, um, both participating in and conducting research. It was really interesting to hear. Um, my question is just talking about accessibility in research studies. Um, do you have any like thoughts on making research studies more accessible? for individuals with profound autism, um, how can they participate in research more? I mean, how can researchers adapt their procedures just so that's more of a possibility? Mm -hmm. No, and that's a, that's a great question as well. I think to, to some extent there is probably a need to do one of two things. In one case, there's probably some sort of study that could be like accessible to the entire spectrum of people such that anyone who fits the autism label overall could participate. Um, and in that case, it would probably have to be somewhat modular so that, you know, anyone who, you know, fits the criteria could come in, but then like some measures are given to people. And then, you know, if you are nonverbal, et cetera, then you, you know, skip some measures, et cetera. Um, alternatively, there are probably studies that are like fit only for people with intellectual disabilities or only with people who have profound autism or only people who are nonverbal, et cetera. And those have like more behavioral supports. Those people have, you know, much longer visit, or sorry, much shorter visits, but much like more intensive supports and things like that and they're, they're made for that population. I think if you kind of do that one size fits all thing, you have to be much more accommodating and it would be a, you know, kind of like there's, there was this big like SORS trial for oxytocin, they tried that. I think it may have like washed out a lot of the data by doing that, but they really tried to like, yeah, let's get measures that work for all the kids. Yeah, let's like, you know, get everyone in here because we really care about getting the whole spectrum. It's, it's a good approach, I like that, but I do think you have some more impoverished phenotyping by doing that. It's sometimes hard and then like, do we all believe there is like one autism that covers everything? I don't know, you know, everyone is pretty convinced that autism isn't one thing, I think. Um, so, 
then, I mean, I think it's probably better to do a more specialized study that like focuses just on profound autism. We work really hard to make sure that you can just phenotype that group really well, but then, you know, what is the border of that group? That's the hard part, you know, where do you draw the IQ cutoff, where do you draw the behavior cutoff? Things like that, those are not easy questions, like, you know, what's the comparison group? Things like that, they're all methodologically fraught, but still interesting. Um, and so then how do we like do that research well? And you know, anyway, like obviously probably things to talk off off the stage, but I, I think that like the better way to do that I think is to kind of fractionate the diagnosis, not to like lump it in and hope that we can do everything well. Um, thanks so much for the talk, and I have to say I really feel like this is the future for autism research. It feels like this is kind of what we have to do in order to have the research really work and improve. Um, that being said, I wonder if you have any thoughts about things we need to be careful about. So what the challenges of this kind of approach are going to be, what pitfalls might, be, might come up, and how researchers can really effectively navigate that, particularly thinking about that the lived experiences of different people might be quite different. Um, if we're thinking ab about autistic advocates um, and adults from parent perspective, sibling perspective, et cetera, having all those people in the room, they're not always gonna agree. You might have really different voices. Um, so I'm wondering what your thoughts on about how we as researchers really do this well in mm -hmm. a way that will hold up over the years and increase the quality of our research. Yeah, um, no, I think that's a, that's a great, question and, and one that I have been thinking a lot about because I think there is a, a lot of interest right now within the autism researcher community about doing participatory research but it's not something you can just pick up and run with. Like any other research methodology, it's something that you get training in that you actually put time and effort into and have to learn to do well. Um, and so some people are better at it than others, some people will try it and feel like they don't like it and decide to discard it like any other, you know, methodology. And so in this case, really, I think you need to have people start to get formal training in it. I think you have to have people do studies in it and find out what works and doesn't work, have people have mentorship in it. People need to have guidelines for it. I mean, the nice thing is there is one set of guidelines that I tend to, uh, send people to which are the, the Aspire guidelines um, that tend to be pretty good. They have a toolkit on their website as well. Um, also in the, the INSAR um, website for the, um, the ICCR, the INSAR Community Collaborator Request, we have um, some resources down at the bottom of the page there um, for researchers who are interested in potentially doing participatory studies. Um, so those are potentially helpful. But at the end of the day, I think, um, a lot of it comes with just not relying overly on specific lived experiences, just, just like you can get very anchored to, you know, one particular opinion or theoretical framework or hypothesis, I think, you know, diversity is key here. Um, you can, like, very easily think, oh, well, this person's lived experience goes in line with, like, my confirmation bias of what I think this is going to be in terms of my hypothesis, et cetera. And I think you have to broaden. You have to include a lot of people on your community boards. You have to include a lot of people in the research team. And you shouldn't be afraid to, like, have people disagree with each other. You just need to be aware that, uh, you know, there is going to be some disagreement and you want to make sure that you have the right people who don't get overly combative. And, and norm setting is also important. Like, make people aware, you know, ahead of time that, like, we are not going to necessarily, as the research team, just, like, when you say something is your experience, that doesn't mean it's going to steer the project that way. There might be some disagreement. That might be okay. I hope this is okay with you before we get started, et cetera. So, you know, and that, like, norm setting goes a long way. Um, I work with Spark, and I'm on the communications team, um, and I, I, I feel like I've actually tweeted you from Spark uh, a couple times, so hello. Um, but I, <laughs> uh, I really appreciate this. I think that um, a lot of us in comms and, and throughout our study are, are really determined to make it as inclusive and accessible as possible. Um, thank you for your participation as well. Um, but I am, you know, from a comms perspective and just like a basic 
perspective, language is important. And th there's obviously a lot of conflict uh, around terminology, but in general, I think um, there's challenges, um, you know, reaching out to autistic adults in the population um, to get them interested in um, research long term because a lot of them have already found their way, uh, you know, through much of their own ind independent and their family and community. You know, they've had to figure out a lot of things on their own. Um, and, you know, I just am curious as to what, how you communicate with autistic adults in the community to encourage them uh, specifically to participate in research and, and, and how we can all improve our language and um, outreach. Mm -hmm. Sure, I, and you know, to, to some extent, um, there may be some people who will never participate in research. Uh, there may be some people who are very interested always. I, you know, research participation and participant biases are something that I think about a lot too. It's because I, you know, I'm doing an in-person study right now. I have a very interestingly skewed sample. It's something like an IQ of a uh, mean of like 117. They're very much overeducated white women on the whole. Um, and it's, it's fun, it's interesting, but you know, it's a lot of university affiliates. It's a lot of people who get their care at the medical center. Um, now I can go pound the pavement and get a lot of people from underserved communities and that would be really helpful. But to some extent, you know, you have to balance different priorities when you are recruiting. You know, what do you want to achieve in your recruitment, right? Do you really need a representative sample for the questions you're asking? Um, if so, then great. Then you know, put your like eggs in that basket. It's going to be really important to get your representativeness. If you are trying to understand something general about autism that is probably not like moderated by these various things, then okay, then that's probably not where you need to put your time and money. Um, if you want to have a prevalence estimate that is, you know, extremely important that you need to get a representative sample because then that is going to have a lot of impact. Um, but like for things that aren't descriptive, that you're trying to probably understand like a mechanistic something, in a lot of cases, representativeness is a lot less important actually. Um, not to like say that like that isn't something you should care about, but, um, to the extent that we, as researchers, really try to make inferences about the population, um, we can do a lot with convenient samples. And we do in psychology. A lot of these findings from large samples hold up remarkably well, um, which is why things like Spark Research Match happen to you know, be useful anyway when we recruit our sample of like 600 adults that's like 80% white, um, which is great. <laughs> I hope that answered your question. 